What is up, Janksters? It's your boy, Graham, also known as HamHawks42 on the internet. And in this edition of the Overthinking MTG podcast, I want to take a look at a lot of, well, a handful of cards, actually. So rather than doing just one deep dive, I want to take a look at kind of a roundup of cards right now that are causing a bit of a stir in standard and have a lot of eyes on them at present. And I want to kind of share my thoughts with them. So this is as it relates to standard. Uh, and the reason that I want to talk about these cards is we have a ban announcement coming up next week as of this recording. The ban announcement is going to be on May 29th, 2023, and I'm recording this on May 24th, 2023. So we are a scant five days away from some number of cards being banned in standard. And we there are a lot of opinions and a lot of feelings about which ones should be included. And I guess this is my opportunity to kind of share my thoughts on some of these cards that are going around. There also was a leak allegedly in big old finger quotes that Wizards directly responded to and said is bogus. Uh, I believe so fake was exactly how they uh, deemed it. Somebody on Reddit was trying to cause a stir, maybe modify card prices or at least drum up some kind of reaction. But in any event, they listed eight cards. I'm not gonna talk about every single one of those specific cards, but I'm gonna talk a lot about a lot of those as well as at least one that some people didn't see on that list and we're kind of surprised by. So let's break it down and I wanna get started with what I believe is the single most problematic card in standard. And I am going to qualify that and explain what I mean by it. And that card is none other than Reckoner Bankbuster. Believe it or not, no, that's right. I started without Fable the Mirror Breaker. Um, don't worry, we'll get there. But a Reckoner Bankbuster, the reason that this card strikes me as incredibly problematic is that it fits in aggro strategies and that as a vehicle, it practically gives all your creatures haste. Anything with power three, at least, can deal four damage to your opponent if they don't have something on board to soak up that impact. Um, and even if they do, it's a four, four. So like it, it can tangle with them in the early game. And beyond that, every single time you have two excess mana, you can just tap and draw a card. I mean, drawing cards is great and you get three of those. Once you're out of cards though, you then get a pilot so the Bankbuster crews itself. So it's almost as good as putting a four four on the battlefield at that point. Um, you also get the token, which may be relevant and it gives you a treasure, which is just unnecessary. The biggest reason that this card is problematic though, like obviously it's very cheaply costed for what you get, but what it really gives you is card advantage in any color being able to cheaply and efficiently draw cards outside of, co of colors that are traditionally good at that i.e blue is usually pretty like it's difficult to keep up with that this gives mono white a source of card draw which is something that that color historically should struggle with um same is true with green, believe it or not. Like green has a lot of ways to draw cards based off of creatures historically, but if you don't have creatures, green shouldn't be able to draw cards in theory. I know there are like exceptions to this, but as a result, like this being able to just draw cards in those colors, granted green has all kinds of trouble right now, so that's not a great example, but when those kind of cards or when those kind of colors can get card advantage, all of a sudden the benefit that traditional controlling decks have of being able to generate card advantage beyond the opponent is suddenly more or less negated, especially in the early game, while this puts a threat on board that those decks need to answer all of a sudden. So this is why like a lot of control has struggled in recent months, or at least this, this is a factor towards why control has struggled in recent months. Um, yeah, I think Bankbuster is just strictly too good. This can fit in, like you can make a case for this going into almost every deck. And on top of that, I did actually uh, take a look at untapped.gg, uh, which is a cool website where you can actually, um, you know, where you can track games and get play stats. And according to that, out of 160,000 games in best of three standard, Reckoner Bankbuster made an appearance with at least a single copy in the main deck in 64% of decks. Granted, this is best of three, not best of one. Be aware of that, that makes a huge difference. But in best of three, this appearing in over 60% of decks, I mean, that's big time. Those are scary numbers. Those are like Omnath inclusion numbers. And this card doesn't often get talked about because all it's doing is drawing the cards, which at the end of the game is the advantage that can win you games of attrition, which these mid-range battles often are, but it's not the card that is delivering the death blow in most cases. Although even then it's possible for this card to do so. But anyway, I think this card is phenomenal for two mana of colorless. You can put it in absolutely anything. There's almost no reason not to run it. If you're running a mid-range pile, 
it's the best and on top of that it also combos with things like blood tithe harvester three power two drops are kind of everywhere and this just lines up really nicely with those like your turn three you can drop a blood tithe harvester and cut down your opponent's blocker crew your bank buster get in for four damage the amount of benefit and advantage you accrue on the board in that kind of situation is nuts and that is not a far-fetched sequence that is not a far-fetched turn three we've all seen it anyway so the next card that i want to talk about i feel like i've said my piece on bank buster if if, if only one card gets banned on monday one i'll be very disappointed because i think a lot of these should be banned but i hope it's this one believe it or not now if only one kid card gets banned the one i actually think is going to get banned is fable of the mirror breaker uh this is no surprise to everyone it is widely considered the single best card in standard right now and honestly i mean my thoughts on bank buster aside like fable and bank buster are an easy one and two um as far as like raw hitting power above its weight class fable probably is it like yes this card is incredible it gives you so much advantage throughout the course of the game it is disgusting and we everybody knows it by now um and so as a result people are playing around it correctly people are you know doing the right thing to try to answer this card now which is good but even then it's incredibly hard and usually represents at least a two for one so if you cast fable the mirror breaker assuming it doesn't get countered on the stack if this enters the battlefield in most situations what is what's going to happen is the opponent will have to answer the goblin shaman or the saga they'll have the usually have the ability to answer one or the other it's oftentimes a shaman um but if they do the other half of the card is still here so you have played a card they have spent a card to deal with half of your card you then get the rest of your card and either half is pretty good frankly if an opponent spends something like uh destroy evil or a ley line binding to get rid of the fable of the mirror breaker that's a piece of removal that isn't going to hit your later threats that's excellent we like that and then your 2-2 shaman can attack next turn unless they spend another card dealing with that so yeah, and, and then you get the treasure token, which ramps you. Um, and if they don't answer any of it, you then get hand filtering and the bargain budget, uh, bargain basement budget Kiki Jiki. Uh, but the reality is even even the Kirkland brand Kiki, Kiki Jiki is pretty freaking sweet. Like, it's still great. So, honestly, every single element of this card is great. As a reanimator player, like, usually when this resolves, it's just, I, I feel like I have cheated. Like, it reminds me of playing old shooters back when I was, like, 10 with, like, the god mode cheat codes turn on. Like, and the happy ammo codes in Doom. I don't know if you guys remember those. But, like, you have it all. The world is at your fingertips. Because what you end up doing is you go to Chapter 2, you discard your reanimation threats, you attack with your shaman, you also hit your land drops because of 2. You, have, you now have 5 mana on turn 4. You then drop out your 5 mana reanimation spell, pull your tracks out of your bin or your Atali. Your opponent's crying. There's nothing they can do. And that, that kind of thing happens all the time. And on top of that, Fable freaking combos with itself. If you have 2 Reflections of Kiki Jiki on the field, wait till your opponent's end step. Tap, 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 tap. You have an army of grizzly bears equal to the number of untapped mana you had going into that end step you get to untap with them and then crush your opponent's face it's silly the card is overpowered and it is line it lines up perfectly this is another reason that control struggles right now now also i've mentioned that a couple of times i don't believe like I, it's funny i don't personally enjoy playing control it's just not my style however i do believe control needs to exist in the format in order to keep these massive mid-range value piles that we have been slogging through for months in check when those mid-range value piles are playing these kinds of threats that are like two or three for ones it results in a situation where the opponent like they must answer this and often have to spend two cards to do so and once again the value of control in generating card advantage is lost so th things like this are why that struggles um and honestly i love this card i play it all the time but for the sake of a healthy format that is less redundant like right now i feel like almost every game of standard is the same game i've played dozens of times before i am ready to see it change and i think a lot of people are fable is a linchpin of the current rakdos and grixis decks that we've been playing against for a long time and 
it, it it's got to go. It just does. I know that. You know that. Wizards of the Coast knows that. There's no way this doesn't get hit in Monday's announcement. No way. This is the safest take I have ever made that Fable is going to get banned. Just watch. I'm going to get I'm going to get flack for this. Then, okay, so now we're going on to the next one that I've heard a ton of people talking about. Oh, and as far as play rates go, in uh, in best of three, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, despite being color locked in red, is in 50% of decks. Um, yeah, it's in it's in 50% of decks in the best of three ladder right now in standard. Half the decks that you go up against are going to be running this card. That is, th those are problematic numbers. Um, next up. Boom, we have Sheldred the Apocalypse. I want to talk about this card because she gets a ton of press, and with good reason. The card is super powerful. Um, a 4-5 Death Archer for 4 is already decent, and then on top of that, you get those abilities, those static abilities. You know them, you hate them, unless you're playing Shale, unless all my mono black mages out there. Um, I'm probably, I, I love black, it's actually my favorite color, but right now, like, we could tone it down a peg and it would be okay. But in any event, uh, Shield of the Apocalypse is bonkers. It is the best four drop creature that we have in standard right now. By a lot. It's kind of not even close. If you're filling out the four drop slot in a deck that has black in it, you need to look at this card and seriously consider it and probably put at least two in because there are plenty of situations in which if you run your opponent, if you force your opponent to, you know, two for one themselves on all your stuff, you then throw shield rid and they don't have removal because they had to spend it on everything else, then it just kills them. Like shield rid just being present if she doesn't get removed will just end the game. And that is noteworthy. That's exceptional. You have to be aware of that. So I've heard a lot of people saying that they want Shield of the Apocalypse banned. And that is a fair feeling. I get it. I respect that. However, Shield of the Apocalypse just entered standard with Dominaria United. Prior to Wizards announcing the three-year rotation schedule, Shield was slated to stay in standard until September of 2024. Now, with the new three-year rotation, she's scheduled to stick around until 2025. Now, I understand that she was the best thing since sliced bread in standard since the day she was released. And as a result, we have all played a ton of games against Sheldred at this point. She like hit the ground running, made a huge splash for herself with last year's rotation, by the way. So yeah, she's been around for a while now. We're coming up on a year of Sheldred being in standard in a few months here. But still, I don't think Sheldred will see a ban at this point because if Bankbuster and Fable and another card that we're gonna talk about later that I think might be on the shortlist as well, if they hit the, the Rakdos deck, if they really like knock that deck down a peg with a couple of other bands, which I fully expect to happen, then all of a sudden, Sheldred loses her supporting cast. And yes, the card is still very strong. However, the opponents um, are gonna be, are gonna have an easier time answering Sheldred because they don't have to answer a million other things before she shows up. So I have a feeling she becomes significantly less powerful. Also, um, aggro in Soldiers and Mono Red become very strong the moment the Rakdos deck drops because the, the Rakdos de deck is just absolutely loaded with, um, well, it's loaded with removal right now. And so those aggro decks struggle to keep up with that. And then Sheldred gaining life while draining your opponent and presenting a four or five body that they somehow have to attack through is, um, is a very meaningful and it helps kind of protect against aggro. So it helps check aggro for those mid-range decks. I don't, I don't anticipate Wizards is going to ban Sheldred right now. I think they're going to knock down the other elements of the deck that have been around longer and then see how Sheldred holds up. If she continues to be problematic in the format, which is possible, then they might take other action. Um, they have announced that they're going to have a ban window every year. I will be absolutely shocked if Wizards doesn't do something um, before then, if this next announcement is the only ban we have in standard for a whole year, unless the upcoming sets are power crept to the absolute moon, standard is probably going to be fairly stale um, in pretty quickly. Just part, that's also Arena's fault part to, to some degree. Don't get me wrong. I love Arena, but we play a ton of games all the time. So this happens. So in, in, in short, I think Shield Red is a very strong card that Wizards definitely needs to keep an eye on. And right now it is played 
in 45% of decks in best of three. Now, I have a feeling that's mostly skewed because of the Rakdos deck. The Rakdos deck is super popular, and as a result, this card is super popular. Uh, she also fits in the Esper Legends list, depending on certain builds of that. Um, so I think she's I think she's good and potentially too good, but without the rest of the deck, I, I don't think she's gonna be as bad as people think. I might eat my words on that, I'm okay being wrong, but uh, honestly, I, I don't think Sheldon is going to be as bad as everyone thinks. Right now, she's the nail in the coffin in those Rakdos matches, and it hurts to see her show up, but I don't think that means the card is over pro overly problematic. I think the whole deck is, frankly. Uh, which brings me to the, the next one I want to talk about, <clears throat> and that is Invoke Despair. So this card is the five mana card uh, that everybody, like, except, again, our mono black mages out there. I see you. I respect you. Appreciate you. Keep doing what you're doing. Just, I, I, I'm, But I'm going to groan at it. Because <laughs> um, Invoke Despair is just way too powerful for what it does. It is a guaranteed three for one every single time. Your best bet against Invoke Despair is to play out as much crap as you can possibly do prior to turn five so it has a minimal impact. You want expendable stuff just lying around. That's one of the reasons that actually I've been playing a lot of um, Bitter Reunion, the looting card from, um, or the rummaging card rather, from Brothers War. I love that because it leaves behind a two mana enchantment. Now that enchantment can give my whole team haste, which it can be relevant in the late game as a way to close the game out, but in the short term, it eats up an enchantment slot from Invoke Despair, so that doesn't hit my Fable or my Cruelty of Gix that maybe is on chapter two or whatever. So, I don't know, Invoke Despair, there are ways to play around it, but at the end of the day, you will 100% every single time, unless you counter it, get three for one, every time. Your opponent is going to remove three of your things, or none of your things, but if they remove none of their thing, none of your things, they draw three cards, and you take six to the frickin' face. like. It is just dominant, it's super powerful, um, and beyond that, the biggest knock against Invoke Despair is that it is unfun to play against. It is an effect that unless you have stack-based interaction, there is nothing you can do, and in many situations, in these mid-range attrition battles, it is just going to knock you out at the knees. So. Fable the Mirror Breakers actually, the Invoke is one of the few clean answers to Fable. Because if they don't have any other creatures lying around, it kills the Shaman and it kills the Fable, and they take two to the face and you draw a card. So that's definitely worth it for five mana, no question. Um, and it, it, it helps with uh, wedding announcement and things like that as well. But in general, th this card is super powerful and it is like shockingly unpleasant to play against like getting hit by this is miserable and that's the kind of play experience that maybe like i don't know that it lines up with the win rate necessarily but it definitely is like an anecdotal uh fact that i know wizards has taken into account with other ban announcements or you know other ban decisions and uh i think they'd, it'd be in their best interest to be oh, at least aware of that here man invoke despair uh, yeah, th this card is not fun, and I would, I wouldn't be surprised if it is not on the ban list. But I would also not be sad to see it go if it is. Oh, the other main issue with this is that even though this this ha this card does actually have a very drastic downside, in that it requires four black mana to cast. That should be a massive downside. But with all the treasure generation in the format, as well as tri lands and the slow lands, we also have the fast lands and the pain lands right now. Like we have a lot of very playable dual land and even tri land cycles that can get you black mana. So even in three colors, it's not hard to get to four black mana. The color fixing is standard right now in certain, like in certain colors is not hard. And getting like in Grixis or Jund, getting to four black, very easy, very easy. Anyway, so I'm not calling for the ban necessarily, but if it happens, I'm not mad. All right, the next one that I wanna talk about is a card that I actually really enjoy as a reanimator player, but I understand that it's already getting old and she hasn't even been here that long, and that is Attracts a Grand Unifier. Uh, this is one that honestly, I don't anticipate getting any kind of um, attention. I will be shocked if Attracts a Grand Unifier actually hits a ban at this point. Meanwhile, I will also be completely shocked and befuddled and confused if Attracts a Grand Unifier survives in standard until her scheduled rotation in 2025. I don't think that's gonna happen. I think Attracts is going to be banned at some point, but it's probably not gonna be next week. She just showed up in Phyrexia, I will be one. 
She's an incredibly powerful card, no question about it. But honestly, bottom line, she's too new. She's still very big, she's still splashy, and there are a lot of decks. Like, we have Reanimator decks, we have Breach the Multiverse decks, we also have five color domain decks that are ramping to Atraxa that are gaining a lot of traction in standard right now. So, we, I don't know. Like, if depending on how the ladder shakes up in the next couple of days, Wizards might throw Atraxa on the ban list going forward because if you check a lot of these, um, a lot of these other elements, I mean, she becomes the one of the best things you can do, like right away. Um, because again, it's not hard. The mana fixing is not hard, and there are a lot of very playable ramp packages that can get you to seven mana relatively quickly. And these colors are not that hard to juggle. The other thing about a track that makes her devastating is as a 7-7 seven, seven flying Vigilance, Death Touch, and Lifelinker for seven, she is already worth the price of admission. The fact that when she hits the battlefield, she is going to draw you from like three to six cards, potentially like seven, I think, and a lot. You can get a ton of cards off this. And so yes, Atraxa dies to removal, but all the cards that she just loaded into your hand do not. And if your opponent is playing, if you are playing Atraxa and you are playing in a reanimator shell and your opponent kills Atraxa and she goes back to your graveyard, that means you get to use one of the reanimation spells that Atraxa just drew you to pull her back out and do it again. Like th this card is nuts. It's straight up insane. Um, and because Atraxa Grand Unifier is in the meta, I would highly recommend everybody who has white in their deck, seriously consider um, Elish Norn, Mother of Machines, at least in your sideboard. Because Atraxa Grand Unifier is huge. She's super powerful. Again, I do not think she's going to get banned this upcoming week. But within the next two years, I do think she'll lead a ban. I don't know how long she'll last, but I'm giving her more than a week. <clears throat> All right, another card that I personally would like to see hit the ban uh, announcement that, I don't know, I can see it either way. I wouldn't be surprised if it happens, but I don't fully expect it, but I would like to see it personally, is Wedding Announcement. I personally feel like Bankbuster, Fable, and Wedding Announcement all represent card draw engines that are auto includes in their respective colors. If you are in a white deck, you really ought to put Wedding Announcement in. It doesn't really matter. If you're going wide with creatures, Wedding Announcement is going to draw you cards and buff the creatures once you get to flip it. If you are going like into deep into the late game with like trying to do a more controlling build with like Planeswalker support, it's going to draw you cards in the early game or put bodies on board that your opponent has to respond to and deal with and then have an Anthem lying around. So like if you end up with tokens later, they just are bigger just because. The card is nothing short of incredible. Oh, and there's the Selesny Enchantments list that's out there right now, leveraging Calyx that can make multiple copies of this thing too. Like it, it is incredibly powerful for three mana and it gets you multiple cards worth of value over the course of a couple of turns. That's ultimately, and, and, and it gives you straight up card advantage. That's ultimately what those three cards have in common. Bankbuster, Fable, and Wedding Announcement present multiple cards worth of value over multiple turns. That is, that's worth a lot, and they're all very cheap for what you get. So this is one of those cards that I personally would like to see it go, but to be honest, um, in doing a little bit of research for this, I was really shocked at looking at the untapped.gg data. Wedding Announcement right now is only included in less than 10% of decks um in in standard right now which i was I, I, that was significantly lower than i would have guessed because i felt like this thing was everywhere for a long time and apparently it just isn't anymore which i guess kind of checks out like i still see it when i'm going up against mono white sometimes but even then not always so i don't know i thought this card was going to be much more ubiquitous and much more problematic than it currently shapes up to be however if you take fable out of the mix all of a sudden, Wedding Announcement could slot into that role as people modify their decks to have it like, and all of a sudden, maybe Mardu becomes the thing. Like, maybe that's the next deck. Or, you know, Esper, you know, maybe really steps in and becomes even more dominant. Not that it's, like, super dominant now, but it's very playable, very real. And I think Wedding Announcement is a factor in all of that because it provides a lot of card advantage and a lot of value. So this is one that it was on that, like, debunked leak um, that, that was out there, and... I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. The other factor with Wedding Announcement, though, that I would be okay if this saw a ban, because it has been the core engine of cards for 
like well over like um, like we're coming up on a year and a half um yeah here in a year and a half uh, we're go well, it's almost two years the wedding announcement is a card that would have rotated this year had the rotation schedule not been modified so in the interest of shaking up standard i would like to see wedding announcement go just because it is a core piece of decks that we have all gotten very used to and i don't know i'd like to find I, i'd like to be presented with opportunities to find other tools that can fill those roles as a brewer that's the kind of stuff i like and that's what i want my standard to be which is why i'm not a huge fan of the rotation change um and so if wedding announcement got swept up in a large suite of bands just to kind of like semi-rotate some of the more like m some of the more ubiquitous cards I, I i would be very happy with that if they don't cast a very wide net with their bands though this is going to get hit um and we'll just continue to see it for a while and it may develop problematic play rates depending on what decks are eyes we'll see but it's a very good card and has the potential all right another card that i want to talk about this next one uh, like straight up i'm not burying the lead this is not gonna get banned period it's not it is not seeing problematic play rates it is not seeing pro problematic win percentages it is not in any position to be banned uh, in standard in the interest of competitive diversity but in just kind of keeping my ear to the ground and being on my streams and talking with people, I've heard a ton of flack about this card and a ton of bad feelings directed towards this card. And I've seen like dozens of people calling for it to be banned because it represents a miserable play experience that can be backbreaking and incredibly unfun to try to come back from. And that card is Farewell. Honestly, I understand the feels bad. Farewell is kind of similar to Invoke. Once it hits, you're going to get blown out, period. This, though, is so much worse than the Invoke blowout. In the Invoke blowout, you end up getting domed, like, for some damage. Your opponent draws some cards, and you lose some number of permanents. That can hurt. If Farewell hits, and you don't have any Planeswalkers or Battles, you lose straight up everything except your lands everything if you don't have a fist full of cards that can help you rebuild from this it's you're done and uh, i mean heaven forbid you're playing like an artifact or enchantment themed deck i've definitely run farewell in a couple of decks and i i've been queued up against decks that are almost exclusively artifacts and when, and i've hit my farewell and i've just said artifacts graveyards boom my opponent lost straight up everything and like I lost nothing or like maybe a blood token and one empty bank buster, you know, like the amount of value that this card can generate and how crippling it can be if it drops is real. Like that is absolutely real. And it doesn't help end the game. It just helps prolong the game and prevent you from losing, which is what control players absolutely need. As a board wipe, though, at six mana, this does not help you against aggro. By the time you could have cast this, aggro is going to have killed you twice. There is no way that a six mana sweeper is enough to deal with aggressive decks. Farewell is a like a mirror breaker in certain control matchups, and it can knock out some mid range decks that let you get to six mana. Like if you can struggle with your opponent back and forth, leave some material on board, let them think they have the advantage, and then you know hit this, and then drop your threats you have an opportunity to co go over the top on against mid range. So honestly, I think farewell is actually a decent tool to deal with the current menaces of the format. And it's kind of the things that control needs in order to be competitive. And so if control is going to become a solid competitive archetype, banning farewell, just because it has, it's a feels bad. Honestly, I don't see that as helping uh, per se. So I don't know from a competitive diversity standpoint i think we need farewell to remain in the meta but like don't get me wrong i have rolled my eyes and groaned or swore and gotten pissy when farewell farewell has hit me when i had lethal next turn absolutely it feels real bad to get blown out by this card 100 percent, no question but it's one of those things where it's part of the game and honestly most of the time when farewell hits me um if farewell hits i will usually like let them pass the turn, draw one more card, then scoop is usually how it goes. Unless I hit something that can help me close it out even faster, like post haste. But yeah, farewell is like, it can be truly devastating. The fact that this is graveyards, especially like, I got my stuff in play, but come on, man. Let me, let me have my graveyards. Anyway, there are two more cards that I want to talk about today. 
because um, different people on different social medias, it's funny. You can tell like who's playing best of one versus best of three, and who like in as we're talking about different um, cards as far as these these band speculations are concerned. And the one that I find really funny is there are a ton of like outspoken like mono black or Rakdos players um, that were not super happy <laughs> when it looked like for you know the, when the leak showed invoke i think shaldred was on the list and uh you know fable and bankbuster all those all those were getting hit like the rakdos deck was clearly on the chopping block which i'm sure it is um but one card was absent from the league that may potentially be on the the actual ban list although to be honest i don't think it will be and that is thalia guardian of thraben uh this is a card that honestly of all the cards that we've talked about today this one is the one i have the most personal beef with because i run a lot a lot of non-creature spells in my early game in most of my decks um, and so this knocks me off curve and often especially in the soldiers deck or the esper legends deck this card single-handedly destroys some of my most powerful decks. My current ladder deck is a Mardu reanimator list, and, like, all of the plays up until three, and even then, like, well into four and five, the vast majority of my plays are non-creatures. Like, I'm trying to get to Breach, and so I have removal spells, I have Liliana the Veil, um, you know, I have all of these really powerful, and, it, you know, ultimately with Breach the Multiverse and um, Cruelty of Gix in the mix, too, a lot of these very powerful, like, effects, but all my creatures are heavy. In the early game, I'm definitely trying to cast non-creatures. So Th Thalia taxing those, while also putting a 2-1 first striking body on, on board, is very real. And the fact that she's a soldier means she fits perfectly into that soldier's list, which is a strong competitive list right now that might become even better if a lot of these cards get hit. So honestly, Th Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, um, it's excellent. Like, this card is great. It buys the soldier deck often another turn before the board wipe. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting on a Brotherhood's End or a Depop without the ability to rock it out on time because Dahlia was sitting there. And I've lost those matches as a direct result of, you know, the additional, like, six, seven, eight damage that I took the following turn that I wouldn't have had this tax effect not been present. So Thalia is an incredibly powerful card. The reality is, though, even if the top end cards that we've talked about today get banned, we still have a ton of incredibly powerful cards out there. Is getting your stuff taxed fun? No. Like, is getting is getting taxed fun while you're getting beat down? Absolutely not. But it's a viable strategy that has been a core strategy in Magic for an incredibly long time. And if Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, is a problem, you you know you just need to modify your approach as a player. Play with fire is legal in this format. Cut down is legal in this format. Lay down arms is legal in this format. Almost every color has a clean one mana answer to Thalia, except poor old green. Um, so there we go for that. And I guess blue doesn't have a way to cleanly answer Thalia once she's on the board. Uh, but regardless, she's she's manageable. She's strong, she's very good, but she's not problematic, I don't think. So, as much as I dislike Thalia, and also, she's part of an incredibly dominant curve. Right now, the Esper Legends deck has a, has a curve that if it, if it executes perfectly, if they have an excellent starting seven and can pull this off, it can be back-breaking to just about anyone. Turn one, Skrelv, turn two, Thalia, and turn three... Rafine Scheming Seer, which is the last card that I want to talk about today because some people are speculating that Rafine might actually be um, in the crosshairs for a ban because of the Esper Legends list being one of the better decks, assuming that some other things get knocked off the top. If we lose Fable, if we lose Bangbuster, if we lose Invoke, if we lose Atraxa, then all of a sudden, the best thing to be doing is going to be Esper Legends. It just is. And so Thalia and Rafine are a key piece of those of, of that deck. And, you know, the, one of the best curves you can possibly execute. Skrelv, Thalia, into Rafine. Because now Rafine has Ward. Thalia taxes your opponent's removal by one. And Skrelv provides protection to your entire board. The moment Rafine drops, you swing with Thalia. You connive at least once. Probably only once, actually. Um, and then... You also are setting up for a potentially dominant turn four, such as Shaldred. So the Esper Legends list is very strong. There's no question. It can provide a ton of value and really beat down the opponent. That said, I don't think it's in a problematic state right now. Honestly, I have watched some really brilliant players t take the, the Esper Legends list 
into standard tournaments like over at the pizza box where i do commentary uh many sundays it's a lot of fun i, I definitely check them out pizza box mtg but um and hollywood pizza on twitch but I've watched that deck get off to an incredibly explosive start and look unbeatable. I've also watched it get completely dumpstered by these removal heavy mid range packages that just leave it with nothing on board and like uh, an empty, uh, an empty hand. And if you get to that point in this deck, you're going to struggle really badly. Like it needs to be coming out front and really take over. And as a result, I've seen a lot of brilliant players play the deck very well and still not quite make top eight in those events. So, the deck is good. It is strong. I would. I don't think it's problematic in any way. Um, you know, I'm not seeing. I, I don't have as a, and just anecdotally as an arena player, I haven't had the oh here we go again to Rafine. I have that towards Fable, and I have that towards Invoke. Like I have that feeling of just okay, we're doing this again, and Bankbuster for that matter. I am so sick of wrecking our Bankbuster. So anyway, Rafine is one that I think is, people have been talking about quite a bit. The card is strong. It is very, very good. It is not problematic. So, um, the other one that was mentioned in like the leak man announcement was Plaza of Heroes, which I, the card is good, but I don't. And legends are very powerful right now, but I, I like the idea that that card is bannable. Honestly, like I get that it's strong and it helps decks like the Esper Legends deck, but I, I don't think it's I don't think it's problematic like at all. Actually, um, I, I don't see it hitting a spot like like this. Anyway, uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, Bankbuster's got to go, Fable's got to go, and I would like to see Invoke go. I think those three are probably, like, I don't know, those three are probably on the in the mix, but if, it, if I was making the decision, it would be Wedding Announcement, Fable, Bankbuster. Those are the three that I want to see go, because they are the core engines that have been driving Standard since, you know, Kamigawa dropped, and Wedding Announcement since even longer, th longer than that. And those would provide the deepest foundational shakeup to the format. I would be very intrigued to see what fell out the other side of that. I think we're gonna get some of these. I don't think we're gonna get all of them. We are gonna have to wait and see until Monday, May 29th, to see what is official and what Wizards agrees or disagrees, um, you know, with uh, on this front. Anyway, thanks so much for checking out this episode. I appreciate it very, very much. I'm gonna go get a glass of water because I've been talking nonstop for half an hour. <laughs> and I uh, appreciate you. This has been a rather extended uh, edition of the Overthinking MTG podcast. This is actually a regular podcast that you can get anywhere podcasts are available as well as on YouTube. So if you wanna hear my gums flap about individual magic cards, that is a thing that I do, one of the many services I offer. And if you enjoy the various services I offer here on Twitch, on YouTube, wherever the case may be, um, I do actually have a Patreon. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can help support me over there. So there's a link to that in the description. Thank you for even considering it. And thank you for listening and watching up until the end. It means the world. I appreciate you, and I'll catch you on the next one.